Oh, yes. Leisha had an uh, operation yesterday. Was it yesterday? Friday. Friday. And uh, on her neck. And she's doing well. She's fine. She's home now. And so just keep her in your prayers. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask if Pastor Mike, will you please come up? We want to pray for you. I want to read a portion of scripture here. Um, you know, Tanzania is a long way. Stay right over here, right over here. We're going to pray for you right over here. I know you're so, he's a pastor, so he's so used to coming up here and not getting prayed for, but we want to pray for him this morning. He's on his way to Tanzania, which is a pretty good distance away, and it's a, quite a travel in two weeks. You're leaving next week, but you're staying for two weeks. You're staying for two weeks. It's difficult when you go to a new culture and you go to uh, things are different. They don't have sometimes running water, no electricity. You've got to compromise. Sometimes they don't have bathroom facilities, and I can leave your imagination up to that. Um, but um, it's, it's hard sometimes. It's difficult. Uh, but this trip, I believe that God is going to do mighty miracles. Many signs and wonders are going to take place. Um, our brother has, uh, has a divine appointment, I believe, uh, with a woman that has a radio station and a, 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 there's a television station, a brother. She just has a program on there. That's the one that you had a dream about, and that was in Brazil. Why don't you make up your stories? <laughs> this is the brother, okay. But anyway, he's going to be on radio and, t and television in Tanzania. It's going to go out throughout the whole region before he preaches. And so let's pray that they'll see that and they'll come and see the white man. Amen? Amen? And that they'll come and get saved. Amen? I want to just read a portion of Scripture. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to go and preach the gospel. Can we all stretch our hands, please, toward him right now? I'm going to ask the elders come up, please. Sam, I want you to come, and I want you to place your hands on him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is my son, Sam, from Nigeria. He had no home, and we took him in, and he stayed with us, and we're his mom and dad. He doesn't have a mom and dad. So we're his mom and dad, and he's from the country of Nigeria, and we want to pray for Pastor Mike right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. As we come, Lord, I know there's other churches praying for him, other churches that are sending him. But Lord, we want to, we want to have our part in this. And so, Father, I just anoint him with oil, Father, in the name of Jesus. And, Father, we just come right now and bring him before you. Lord, we pray no sickness will touch his body. Father, we pray that the food will be uh, digestible for him, Lord, that he'll have clean water, Father, running water, Father, that, Lord, when he preaches the gospel, that many signs and wonders will follow your word. Many souls will be saved, healed, delivered, set free from demonic power. In the name of Jesus, Lord, you said, blessed are the feet of them that bring this good news. And so, Father, we lay our hands upon him and we send him out, Father, among many others that are sending him out to serve you. And we thank you, Father, and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you want to say anything? Huh? Huh? You're just excited? Amen. We're excited and thrilled to have you with us. Let us pray for you. Amen. Who's got Sunday school today? Rebecca and okay. Um, we'll we'll dismiss you now. Time we got. Oh, I don't know if I have time. Hi, sweetheart.
Amen. Well, the whole church emptied out there for a moment. You all come back now. You don't need all those people in Sunday school. Come on, get back here. I looked over. I said, oh, my God, they're all... You know, those on the right go in before the presence of the Lord, and those on the left, well, you're on your own. <laughs> Praise God. Close the doors, please. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe that God has a word for us today, and I believe that God wants us to um, have an attentive ear today because I believe that what you're going to be receiving today will change your life. Amen. We don't want to just come to church just to come to church, just to have church. We want to be changed by the word of God. You know, by the Bible says that by the washing of the water of the word, our minds are changed, our attitudes are changed, our lives are changed, and it takes effort to do that. So this morning, I want to share with you instructions for occupying Canaan. You say, man, what in the world is he talking about this morning? Instructions for occupying Canaan. And everybody knows Canaan land is in Israel, right? You all know that. Okay. But that's the title of my message this morning is Instructions for Occupying Canaan. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do this morning, before I get into the message, I want to read a scripture in Romans 15, 4 from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I think that's on our, our uh, video there. We can put it up there. Everybody knows what this picture is, right? This picture is Tiberias in Israel. We stayed in Tiberias, and that's the Sea of Galilee. That's the very sea that Jesus sailed on and the disciples sailed on. It's quite a thrill to be in a boat going across the Sea of Galilee knowing that our Savior was on that, that lake, if you will. They call it a sea, but it's really a lake. The Bible says, for whatsoever, whatever was written before was written for our, what? Instruction. For what purpose? So that through our endurance, say our endurance. That's not God's endurance, that's your endurance. And through the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. So I'm going to be sharing from the book of Numbers this morning, but I want you to understand that those things were written for our instruction so that through our endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we may have hope. Amen? Praise God. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It says, Now these things happened to them as examples. And they were written as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. All right, turn with me, please, to Numbers chapter 33. I'm going to be reading from, starting from verse 50 to 56. But I'll be stopping along the way, so um, we'll see what happens. It says, can you put that in the Holman Bible, please? The Lord spoke to Moses. First of all, let's stop for a moment and let's look at that. This is not some man speaking. This is not a popular uh, book that's being spoken of. It's not a bestseller. It's not someone who's famous. This is the Lord. And he spoke to Moses, and he spoke this to Moses. And remember what I said in the beginning. Those things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction. And so here he, he speaks to Moses in the plains of Moab and by the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, how many know that God gave a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he was going to give them a land. 
Now, that was a promise, wasn't it? Wasn't God giving him a promise? Well, God gave him a promise. He says, and I'm going to bring you by the Jordan across from Jericho. I want you to understand for a moment that in this promised land that God was giving his people, there was going to be some future difficulties. As they were going to cross this Jordan, you can read that, read that in the book of Joshua when he crosses the Jordan. But understand that as they were approaching the Canaan land, they saw Jericho. Are you getting this this morning? That was a future situation they were going to have to face. In the same way as a Christian, when God takes you from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, into the kingdom of light, and you become a Christian, your whole life changes. You are now walking in a different way. You are now talking in a different way. You are seeing things in a different way. You're being instructed to go a different way. And in this, in this walk that you and I are going to experience, God wants us to take us to the promised land. And that's heaven. The kingdom of God is within you. That's what Jesus said. They were looking for the outward kingdom. Israel was looking for an outward kingdom, saying, when are you going to defeat these Romans so that the kingdom of God... He said, no, 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 no. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. And so now, when they come to this place where they're going to enter into a land flowing with milk and honey, hallelujah, oh boy, we're going to get blessed. It can be a time of blessing. But in the distance, there's a Jericho. Not only that, but they have to learn how to walk through this land. And even in this land, even as a Christian, as we are in this world, but we're not of this world, you're going to face some giants. You're going to face those Hittites and Jebusites and Ahazites. And I think one of the biggest time around Christmas you're going to be coming against is the Havites. That Havite spirit. I got to have it. I got to have this. I got to have that. It's a shopping spirit. <laughs> but in this land, you're going to face difficulties. And he says... When it came to this place, he says, tell the Israelites. See, the problem we have in, a, in, in the world today is we got passive preachers that are remaining silent. But God says when he speaks, he says, tell. God wants to speak, but he wants to tell. You say, well, why doesn't God just say it and tell it? That's not for you or I to ask God that. God has his business. Why doesn't God just preach the gospel in, in his voice from heaven and without sending someone to difficult areas? We, we saw in the news about that, that young preacher that went to the island off of India and they shot him with arrows and killed him. And we all say, oh, well, you know, well, he was a martyr for Jesus. Can you imagine that kind of love, that kind of conviction of the Holy Spirit upon those people now? that they killed this man, and yet I believe that God's going to send more. Because God cares about them people. God cares about them people. Just like he cared about John and, and Peter and John and all of the apostles, and many of them died martyrs. The apostle Paul having his head cut off. He said, tell the Israelites... When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, it's your responsibility and our responsibility as Christians once we get converted, once we get saved and we're placed in the new land, if you will, 
to tell. Come on, somebody. Tell the unsaved what happened to you. Tell them what God has done for you. Share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, when you cross over, or when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you must, say must, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. When you come into this thing called Christianity, when you become a Christian, there are some things in your life and my life that must go. There are some inhabitants that is in us when we're in the world that God says must go. And we must be the ones to drive out those inhabitants out of our land. Hello. He says, you destroy all their stone images. Say, Pastor, I have a hard heart. Well, God says when he converts you, he takes out that stony heart and he puts in a heart of flesh within you. He changes your heart. Well, you know, before I was a Christian, I... Uh, Aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so did something to me, and I'll never forgive them for that. That's right. In your old heart, you can't. But in your new heart, you can. Hallelujah. you got to destroy all the stone images. Those stone is hard. Stone is hard. It solidifies, and it doesn't move. He says, you must destroy that thing that's in that area of your life or that thing will destroy you. Come on, somebody. Now they have recreational marijuana. You can go and buy it in a retail store. You can buy cookies, crackers, whatever they are, brownies, Cake, all kinds of different brands from all different places, strong, some strong, some stronger. And some Christians, believe it or not, think that because it's legal, it's okay. No, you've got to destroy all of their stone images and cast images. What's a cast image? It's something that has been molded and shaped by the individual. Some of us have shaped and made images, cast images in our minds of the things that we've done in the way that we've lived. And we still coddle that and think it's okay. We have a cast image in our mind. Oh, we have a cast image of, of God that, oh, you know, he's, he, he loves me and he understands. He says, and you must demolish all their high places. All of the philosophies and ideologies of this world and of the enemy, of Satan himself, you must demolish all of the high places that have been established by you being in the world for so many years. You must destroy, demolish all the high places that have been settled in your life. You know that God is in the tearing down business before he builds up? Hallelujah. He'll tear things down in your life. He'll take things out of your life and sometimes we're afraid because that becomes our security blanket. It becomes our comfort zone. But he says, destroy that thing. Get rid of that thing. 
You and I are not supposed to look like the world. There are different cultures in the world, but we're not supposed to look like that culture. If we're a different people, if we're a Christian serving God, then not only is the inward supposed to change, but the outward supposed to change. You're not supposed to look like the world. People shouldn't look at your dress and look at you and identify you with a certain culture that's living today. Hello? Listen to what I'm telling you. They have that goth culture where they wear black. Rings in their ears and their lips and their tongue and their eyebrows and everywhere. And hear me if you're listening to me on Facebook. <clears throat> when you become a Christian, you cannot dress the same way as a gothic dress. I've heard people say, but I do that to identify so, they, so they'll identify me. No, the spirit of Jesus Christ is supposed to identify you. I don't need to go and be around people that are smoking pot so that I can identify with them. I don't need to sit on a bar stool with a drink in my hand so I can identify with them. I shouldn't identify with them. I should be different so that they see something different in me and say, there's something about you. There's some kind of an attraction that you have. What is it that's different about you? You don't talk like the world. You don't look like the world. You don't dress like the world. You don't identify through your dress. Hear me now. You cannot be a transgender and a Christian and living in a transgender life. Come on now, somebody. You cannot be a homosexual. And dress like the homosexuals dress. And they can identify you by your dress. And they're attracted by your dress. Hello? You're supposed to be different. Destroy all their stone images. Demolish their high places. You are to take possession of the land and settle in it. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be going back and forth in the world, out of the world, in the church, out of the church. Don't go back and forth. Make it settled in your mind and heart. I'm going over Jordan and I'm not looking back. I'm going to cross this Jordan and I'm not going back. As we sing that song, the world behind me, the cross before me. Take possession of the land and settle in it. He says, for I have given you the land to possess it. You can't do it. I can't do it in our own strength. But he says, I've given it to you. I've given it to you. Come on, you ain't getting this. I've given it to you to possess. That means take it. Take control of it. I've given it to you. It's in your hands. Go get it. Well, I don't think I want to go that far, Pastor. I think I'll just sit back here, you know, and just sit down here and just wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on the Lord. No. God didn't say to go wait on, on him. He says, you go and possess it. Go is a divine mandate. Like go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's a mandate. God says, go. Amen. Possess it. 
you got to take hold of it. You are the one that God is looking at and saying, you have to be different so that I can be manifested in this life. And then he says, you are. Next verse he says. Bobby, hit that uh, video projector so that it, it's too high. He says, you are to receive the land as an inheritance by law according to your clans. Is that the one I want? Let me see. You are to receive the land as an inheritance by law according to your clans. Increase the inheritance for a large clan and decrease it for a small one. Whatever place the law indicates for someone will be his. You all have gifts and talents that God has given you in this land. Come on. In this land of Christianity, in this new light, in this light, in this kingdom of light that you are now dwelling in, you have gifts and talents. you must use to bring God glory according to the claim increase the inheritance for a large one decrease it for a small one whatever your place of the law indicates for someone will be yours seek God for the gifts that he has for you Corinthians says to desire spiritual gifts you must desire to be used by God. You must, be, you must desire to have gifts in manifestation in your life. Come on, somebody. It's not just to come and occupy a chair and to lift your hands and praise God. God has gifts and talents for you. You say, but I'm not talented. It's not about that. It's about what God's given you. It's not about you. Verse 56, uh, 55. Here comes a warning to those who are walking into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. These are instructions for you and I. But if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, those you allow to remain will become thorns in your eyes and in your sides. And as I was reading this, I thought of my friend Joe. Many years ago, Joe was walking through a, the forest, I guess, a, a bush woods or whatever, and he walked right into a vine with a thorn, and it cut his cornea. He just experienced a few weeks ago a reoccurrence of that in his eye. What happens when that Hit your eye like that. It throws you way off balance. It throws everything into chaos. You can't, the light cannot come in. The, li the, the light hurts the eye, and the eye must be, in, and you must be in darkness. You can't watch TV. You've got to be in darkness and give that time thing to heal. That thorn on that thing cut that. I said, I said, how strange that becomes a thorn in your eye. It causes your ability to not be able to see correctly. Hello? If you allow to remain and don't drive out those things, your spiritual insight will be marred. Your spiritual, your spiritual perception will be marred. You will not have discernment. Your discernment will be marred, marginal. A thorn in your eye. Irritation. 
If you don't drive out the inhabitants in your life and in your heart, those things that are controlling your thinking and your mood and everything else, if you allow it to remain, the Bible says it will become a thorn in your eye and in your sides. Let me ask you a question. Those of us who are married, where did God take the woman from Adam? From the side. Your marriage will be hindered. Come on, somebody. It'll be a thorn in your side. When I thought of the thorn in the side, I also thought of Paul the Apostle. He said, because of the abundance of revelation I have received, there is a thorn, a messenger of Satan, a thorn in my side. You know who they were? That thorn was? It was the people that were persecuting him, coming against him, fighting against his message, fighting against who he is. God says, if you don't drive them out, they will become a thorn in your eye and they'll become a thorn in your side. They will harass you in the land where you live. Don't think for one moment just because you're a Christian, everything's going to be rosy. Everything's going to go smoothly. But it will go the right way if you put God before you. As a Christian, no one's perfect. As a leader, no one's perfect. Are you telling me that I've got to go in and possess this land and, and take care of all that stuff? Yes, you do. But let's look what God said to Joshua just before he was going into Canaan. Joshua 13, verse 1. Oh, no, let me, oh, before you go there, let me finish, let me finish uh, what I'm doing here. I jumped ahead of myself. Go back to verse 55. You're on 55? Okay. But if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, those who you allow remain will become thorns in your eyes and in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you live. Now look at verse 30, uh, 56. And what I plan to do to them, I will do to you. Ooh -ooh. Hello? If you refuse to drive out the land, those things in your life, God says, I plan to do to them. If you don't do it, I will do to you. God's going to do it, not the devil. I was, uh, Bob was sharing a little bit about his trip to me and stuff, and he says, you know, the devil was really hindering us, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know what, sometimes, just think of this. I said, sometimes it's not always the devil. Well, pastor, they were going to go preach the gospel, but well, they're going to go into, uh, into these villages and preach the gospel, and there was a volcano, and it came into the road, and we couldn't take the road. We couldn't go up there. Paul the Apostle said this. He said, I want to go into Macedonia, but Satan hindered us. He wanted to go somewhere one time, and the Holy Spirit forbid him to go. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit forbid him to go and preach the gospel? Yes, because that was not the place they were supposed to be. You've got to be where God wants you to be. If you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land, what I plan to do to them, I'll do to you. That's some serious business. Hello? Wow. You're going to do that to me? Let's go to Joshua 13.1 now. 
By this time now, you know, Moses was getting ready to go and be with the Lord. He was, he was, his ministry was done. God told Moses, by the way, he said, because you hit the rock twice, and you didn't obey my voice and speak to the rock, you hit it. You can't enter the Canaan land. You can't enter the promised land. Imagine that after all Moses did. All the times he listened to God and went before Pharaoh and the mighty miracles, signs and wonders were happening. Oh, glory to God. But he was not allowed into the promised land on earth. But I told someone one day, I said, you know what? But he did get there at the Mount of Transfiguration. Under grace... Come on, somebody. His foot stood right there. I can imagine Moses looking around going, hey, so this is what it looks like. A land flowing with milk and honey. Come on, somebody. Look what he says. Joshua was now old, advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you have become old and advanced in years. But a great deal of land remains to be possessed. Let me tell you something. In this Christian walk, you're never going to reach perfection. There's still a lot of land that needs to be possessed. <laughs> That's why God is patient, long-suffering, kind, gentle. But even when we're older in the Lord, even though we're advanced in the Lord, sometimes even ministers... They think they've arrived. You haven't arrived. There's still much more land to be possessed until the last breath leaves your body. There's still a lot of land that needs to be possessed. And as you're Christians, and many of you are at different levels of walking with God, but you've got to have the heart, you've got to have the desire to remove those things in your life that need to be removed. And stop casting those images in your mind that it's okay. Some Christians have a big, a big molded image in their mind. It's okay image. And they bow to that image every day. It's okay. I don't have to. Well, it's okay. I can do this. Oh, it's, it's okay. <clears throat> There's still a great deal of land that remains to be pos possessed. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says this. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You took off your former way of life. The old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You put it off. If I put my coat off, it's no longer a part of me. You don't see my coat anymore. You see something different. You don't see the coat. Coat's still there. But you don't see it. You took off the former way of life, that old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You've taken it off. How did you take it off? <laughs> You're going to hear this till the day I die. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this. Romans 6, 6. See, I know what Pastor Tom's doing. He's writing it down to keep these references for himself before he goes to them. That's why it takes him a little while to get there. It's not because he can't get there, but he's writing them down because he wants to look them up after. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. See, that's how we put it off, by dying daily. Jesus said, if any man will come and follow after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
It's not a cross of problems and situations. No, it's the cross of the crucified life of recognizing by faith what Jesus has done on that cross for you by slaying that old man, keeping that old man down, keeping him in the grave. You have to do it. I have to do it every single day. Know that our whole self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Go back to Ephesians. You took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your mind. How is that accomplished? By the washing of the water of the word. The more you read, even if you read 10 minutes a day, don't tell me you can't read 10 minutes a day. The devil wants to keep you from this book because when you go into this book, it's going to wash your mind. It's going to cleanse your mind. It's going to cleanse your heart. It's going to cause you to stand on the promises that God has given you. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth what's one of the ways that we can see the effectiveness of this change what's one of the ways we can do that look at Joshua 3:4 I'm driving Bobby crazy because I'm walking back and forth. He's going to follow me. <laughs> Joshua 3, 4. He said, but keep a distance about a thousand yards between yourself and the ark. Wait a minute. Didn't God tell us to get closer to him? If we draw close to him, he'll draw close to us. Now he's telling us to keep a thousand yards from the ark. The ark is the presence of God. But what's, what's he trying to say to us? What's he trying to say? Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go. Can I tell you, there's so many spiritual Christians walking around with this, their heads in the clouds that they don't even know where they're going. You talk to them and they're so spiritually minded, they're no heavenly good. They're so, so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. And there are some Christians that are so earthly minded that they're no heavenly good. He says, keep the distance between yourself and the ark. Don't go near it so that you can see the way to go. For you haven't traveled this way before. It's foreign to you. You may not understand all the way that God has and the place that God has for you. He didn't say, take away the presence of God. He said, just stand back a little bit so you can see because you haven't gone this way before. Don't just get all worshipy and, you know, worship and worship, worship, and you don't grow. You don't develop. You don't take possession of the land. You begin to doubt. You begin to have fear. You begin to have anxiety. You begin to wonder if it's ever going to take place. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. God, I don't see it, but I'm going to walk it. Hallelujah. God honors faith. And even when you walk in faith and you go to the place that God has for you, 
I'm going to tell you something through experience. Is that all right? Can I, can I do that? You're going to fail. That's part of it. I remember Dr. Hero at Zion Gospel Temple. I was in a service and I heard him say this one time and I remembered it and never forgot it. He said this, <clears throat> it is better to fail at something that will ultimately succeed than to have howling success in something that will ultimately fail. That's powerful. Think about that. You're going to fail. Well, we have a thing called grace. We have a thing called the blood of Jesus. We have a thing called atonement. That we can go to our Heavenly Father and say, Now, that's not an excuse for you to keep on doing what you're doing. Come on, somebody. Are you hear what I'm telling you this morning? Because as you walk in the light, as He is in the light... We have fellowship one with another. Come on, somebody. When you're walking in the light, you can't keep doing the things you're doing. You can't keep going the way that you've been going. Come on, somebody. You can't associate with certain people the way you used to associate before. You're different. You're different. You're different. You're, you're representing a different kingdom. Hello. And finally, in conclusion, Joshua 21, starting with verse 43. Oh, yes, Mark. So the Lord, say the word gave, Israel all the land he had sworn to give to their fathers. And they, listen to me now, they took possession of it and settled there. No one can kick Israel out of their land. Israel's not the occupying force in the land of Israel as the Palestinians keep crying out. The occupying, Israel's occupying, it's not their land. It's their land. God gave it to them and you can't take it away. <clears throat> he gave it to them not because of them so much as because he has something to fulfill with his son. Come on. <laughs> to bring down this world, the new Jerusalem, and to fight against the enemies of Jesus. And we're going to be fighting with him. We'll be on the white horses with him. We're coming back to establish righteousness and peace on the earth. But for now, go in. Possess what God has for you. Look at this world. What in this world is worth losing out on the internal, the eternal inheritance you have? <clears throat> is it a woman? Is it a man? Is it is it fame? Is it fortune? Is it houses and cars and all those things that you can't take with you? We strive for those things. We, 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 our emphasis is always on the, on the natural and our supplement is the spiritual. We always put the spiritual last. When the spiritual should be first. The spiritual must be first. God must be first. When it says God must be first, your, the spiritual must be first. 
The Lord, verse 44, uh, yeah, verse 44, the Lord gave them rest. You like rest? How many like to rest? We all like to rest, right? Some of us are lazy resters. I remember when Samuel first got here, he hadn't slept in 48 hours, 24 hours, whatever it was. And he went to bed that night. He didn't wake up until 13 hours later. I said, did you rest? He says, I slept like a dead dog. We all like to rest. And that's why the Lord's day is a day of Six days God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Not because God was tired. He was showing us and giving us an example that we must follow because he knows us that we need rest. He gave them rest, look at this, on every side. You know, you can be walking, and the enemy's so tricky, he'll come right up behind you. God says, you can rest. You can rest. He said, on every side, you have rest according to all that he has sworn to the fathers. None, say none, of their enemies were able to stand against them. Why? Why? Because they had a heart to go in and possess all the land. Their heart was, I'm going in and no one's stopping me. If none go with me, still I'll follow. I'm going into that place that you have for me, God. And if nobody comes with me, I'm going. I'm going to possess the land. We read it just a few moments ago. There was a great deal of land that needed to be possessed. But he brought the presence of God to show you the way because we haven't traveled that way before. He'll give you rest on every side. None of your enemies will be able to stand against them or you. Why? Because you have determined in your heart to go in and possess the land that God has given you. You are determined. For the Lord handed over all their enemies to them. Instead of being handed over to the enemy, the enemy is handed over to you. Go in, possess the land. Let me tell you, you're going to go in, there's going to be an enemy. You're going to have to fight in the land. You're going to have to pursue. Don't be pursued, you pursue. Jesus said, I've given you power over scorpions, serpents, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing by any means shall hurt you. You need to go in and take the land. It's up to you. Don't blame God if you're nowhere in your Christianity. Don't blame God. Hello? He said, I've given you the ark. I've given you my presence. My presence will show you the way in which you shall go. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. He'll give you the right direction. His presence will lead you in the right direction. But you've got to want to. That's up to you. You've got to desire spiritual gifts. You've got the desire to press on with God. You've got the desire to go from this, from this platform to the next platform or from one level to another level. And as Pastor Chris used to say, different levels, different devils. The different level you go on, you're going to encounter more strongholds, more resistance. You can laugh all you want to. You can smile all you want to. I'm telling you right now, this is serious stuff. 
If you don't think you're in a battle for your soul every day, the devil is battling for your soul every day through his philosophies, his ideologies. He's making excuses up for you, and you just go along with those excuses. Let me tell you something. He is battling for your eternal soul. None of your enemies will be able to stand against them. Why? Because they have determined to take possession of the land. They have determined to trust God and the promise that God gave them. He says, I've given it to you. He didn't say, I will give it to you. Given is past tense. Not that I'm going to give it to you in, that, you know, in time. No, he said, I've given it to you. How, how many know that God doesn't sp speak with past, present, and future all the time? Because it's all the same to him. That's why in, in Isaiah it says, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, by his stripes we are healed. We are healed, not will be healed. We are healed. Hallelujah. Look at verse 45 and I'll close. None, say none, of the good promises the Lord hath made to the house of Israel failed. We sang that song, he's never failed me yet. There's no yet with God. There's no yet with God. He's never failed me, period. Not, he's never failed me yet. There's no fail with God. He's never failed, period. None of his good promises the Lord had made the house of Israel failed. Everything, say everything. everything. How many want everything? Everything. everything. Everything was fulfilled. Not some things. Not partial things. Why were they able to be fulfilled? And if you don't answer me, I'm going to preach this whole message all over again. <laughs> Why was God able to fulfill all the promises? Okay, let's... Let's start all over again. Huh? No, not because he's faithful. Who said it? Who said it? You said what? Because they took possession of the land. They believed God. They were going in different. They were not going to go in like looking like the world, trying to identify with them. They were different. The reason why they were different because they carried the presence of God. Yes, I'm telling you, when you carry the presence of God with you. I was with, uh, I closed third time. I was with Pastor John uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we had a, a service and I had a uh, time for people to come up and pray and we prayed with them. And I had lunch with him the other day, and he said to me, he said, Brother Bob, he said, all the people are still talking about your visit. He says, in fact, one lady said she's been dealing with for years with a spirit of depression. She said, you, you prayed over her. That spirit left her, and it hasn't been back, and she is free as a bird. He said, I'm coming. I'm, he says, I want you to come. I want to do a healing service. I want you to come. He says, people you gave words to said it was powerful can I tell you it's time to take it you know I'm sick and tired of hearing oh God is moving in the foreign countries oh God's moving in Africa he's moving in India he's moving all over the place but he's not moving here like he used to I don't settle for that we've got to go in and possess it but that's all of us together come on somebody Stay in the place that God has for you. According to your clan, according to your size. Stay right there. 
Let the presence of God be with you. Walk in that presence of God because you don't know which way to go. Never go where God's presence hasn't led you. All the good promises that God made, God fulfilled. None of the promises that he made failed. And the reason why is because the people didn't get half-hearted. They went in there and they fought. When they crossed the Jordan River, think about this now. As God was with Moses, he was with Joshua. Joshua raised the staff. The Jordan River separated just like the Red Sea. So don't tell me God can't do the same thing twice. <laughs> He did it. And they went on the other side. What was before them? A future Jericho. But because they went in and possessed the land, I'm sure they were shaking a little bit. I'm sure they were a little nervous, seeing these big walls of Jericho, fortified city, the enemy behind you, seeing Israel coming across the land. And of course, you got the devil humming. Oh, they're going to take your land. They're going to take your children. They're going to take your wife. They're going to take your possessions. They're going to kill you. Causing anger to stir up. God said, now when you face your Jericho, you walk around those walls seven times. And on the seventh time, I'm going to ha have you shout. Oh, no, God, you just put down the walls. No. You shout. Why? Because you're in the land of possession. You're in the land of promise. God gave it to you. It's up to you to exercise by faith what God's given you. Bobby, play something for me. I want to ask you this morning, say, Pastor, man, there's some, there's some giants in my life. There's some things in my life I've let go. I've just kind of Try to identify. I've been in the land, but I, I haven't possessed it like I should. But I want to. Because I know that the promises will be fulfilled. Everything, everything will be fulfilled if I do my part. If you want me to pray with you, stand up.